our, our survival on the planet has now come to what we could call an urgent crunch time. We're starting to realize that humanity, by the sheer numbers and by our sheer pressure through our, our um, continued rapid economic growth, is starting to hit uh, what would we start calling hardwired, non-negotiable processes at the planetary level, which means that humanity is starting to, to fiddle with the fundamentals of how the planet works. This has come to a point where scientists are, are talking of humanity having entered a new geological era, the, the Anthropocene. So we're kind of exiting the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, and entering an era, a new geological era, where Anthros, humans, are the main drivers of change. So that in itself has led to the, the insight that we are, we're changing so fundamentally all processes on the planet and, and of course the, the, the largest one and the, unfortunately the only one we're debating is climate change. That humans are warming the planet to a point where the functions of the planet change. But increasingly more and more science shows that that is just one among many processes where we are so fundamentally changing things that the urgency if anything is even larger than what is suggested from the climate science alone. And, and as one example is that roughly half of all our emissions of greenhouse gases are actually absorbed by nature. The world's largest free ecosystem service, all categories, the fact that four gigatons of carbon out of the nine we emit are absorbed in the oceans and in land. So that's an enormous free ecosystem service. So why is the planet doing this? Well, it's because the planet has this fabulous inbuilt resilience. It has this capacity to take disturbances, in this case our human disturbances, absorb them and, and, and still stay in a desired state. And that is the desired state of the Holocene, the state where we've seen civilizations grow from the Egyptian empires all the way to the modern society today. So that is resilience at a planetary level, the capacity to take shocks and still stay in a desired state. What we fear now, and nobody's been able to answer this, question, but science is showing more and more evidence that we may be knocking the planet out of this stable state. And that's where we start now exploring, are there a set of planetary boundaries, safe fences that we would like to be able to quantify to give humanity a safe space to operate? Because if you pass beyond that safe fence, we might be heading towards very very dangerous thresholds, very dangerous tipping points beyond which we could topple over into an undesired state. Well, when we talk of, let's say, the Earth system as a whole, um, a couple of examples. So one is, is clearly the atmosphere and, and uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases, and that one is relatively well re researched, and, and we have a quantitative target there of somewhere in between 350 and 400 ppm concentration of CO2, and we may want to come back to that. But then we believe that, no doubt, do we need to start discussing land use? And as you know, the, the largest driver behind land use change is agricultural development, and, and we've uh, put um, close to 30 percent of the world's land area under some form of agriculture, and, and more and more science shows that most likely that expansion cannot continue. And the reason for that is that not only to preserve biological diversity, but also to preserve source of carbon in, in the soil. Freshwater is another one where we have, you know, increased with the factor seven, the withdrawals of freshwater from our rivers, much faster than population growth. Freshwater is the fundamental production factor for biomass, and biomass is the fundamental regulator of oxygen in the air and carbon in the soil. So that's another one. And then we have the big cycles, the big global nitrogen cycle, the big global phosphorus cycle. And the drama here is that, so nitrogen is in itself interacting with land and atmosphere because when you eutrophy your marine systems, they become less resilient. So they can absorb less carbon dioxide. And if they can absorb less carbon dioxide, you, you hit the climate boundary. So we are, uh, you know, to put it quite, bluntly, but I think appropriately, we are, we are screwing up the nitrogen cycle to an extent that you can barely believe. I mean, we're, we are more than 100% manipulating the global nitrogen cycle compared to the natural fluxes. And that is predominantly the, the fertilizer industry and our modern agriculture. Biological diversity is another one. We are basically today 
uh, killing off a factor of 1,000 more species than the natural background rate of, of species loss and, and at a pace where we are losing biological diversity in, in a, at a magnitude where, of course, we cannot answer exactly where the boundary would be. But what we're starting to understand is that loss of biodiversity is not only about preserving species, it's again to have that toolbox of strength to deal with disturbance. And if you have a situation where you lose diversity and you just have one, two species left, you are in a very vulnerable situation where a trigger comes and systems can, can collapse because of that. So, so there's a whole set of these very fundamental processes. However, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, however we, we scan how many of these may be and, and where they are, we cannot find more than roughly 10, interestingly. So it could well be that as long as we can, you know, stay safe, maintain sustainably 10 or so big processes on the planet, we might have created a safe space for humanity.